Well, thank you all so much for having me, despite the uh, little whale issue from last night. <laughs> Trash in the ocean is an issue everywhere these days, specifically plastic. Since it does not biodegrade, it can't be eaten by bacteria, um, and it just doesn't break down or rust like metal. So you see plastic on the shore, plastic fishing gear stuck on coral reefs, Plastic floating in the near shore. Uh, this is a picture from the Philippines, uh, right near the shore. And even plastic here in Oslo. This is a picture of Oslo Fjord uh, with some trash on the bottom. You can see it on the surface of the ocean, washing away from land here. And the sources come both from the rivers and from trash that is deliberately or accidentally lost from boats at sea. This trash has consequences to marine life, and some of the more dramatic are entanglements, such as this harbor seal that's stuck in some fishing line, the sea turtle that was stuck in some line which warped its growth, these albatross on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are uninhabited islands northwest of the main Hawaiian Islands, and they nest amongst this trash that washes up there. It's not from the islands, it's brought there by the currents, which I'll explain a bit more about in a moment. The albatross also have a problem with eating trash. There are birds that scavenge over the open ocean, eating anything they can find, and historically that worked out for them fine, but now there's so much trash they don't know the difference. So they eat the trash, feed it to their chicks, and sometimes die from it, like this individual. Uh, the bin on the right is the trash that was found in its stomach. And, you know, there are some unintentionally humorous interactions. I always wondered where the sea urchin was going with this fork. <laughs> But it looks like it has a purpose. It looks like it has a plan. But I started working on Trash in the Ocean when I started seeing headlines like this. There was a huge garbage patch. It was posing a huge cleanup challenge. It was twice the size of America, stretching, stretching uh, from Hawaii to Japan, and was 3.5 million. Well, they didn't specify 3.5 million of what exactly. Uh, but 3.5 million certainly sounds extremely severe. <laughs> so I became curious about this. I had just started be uh, studying oceanography as a grad student and said, well, how come we haven't seen this trash pile? Where is it? I mean, my, I was we're going to school in California, which is right in the North Pacific. How come we have not noticed it? Um, but before I tell you about going there, I just wanted to back up a little bit and say why it actually does make sense that there is a large amount of trash in the North Pacific. This map shows the currents, the surface currents of the ocean. And what you'll notice that really stands out is these five blank white spots. Here we are, North Pacific, South Pacific, North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and Indian. And those are the five subtropical gyres. Now these are natural formations of the currents. They're driven by the major winds of the world. So the North Pacific, you have the westerlies that way, the um, trade winds that way, and they push the water, which then with the rotation of the Earth, the Coriolis effect starts moving in this clockwise formation. Incidentally, the Coriolis effect, it works on ocean basins, but does not work in toilets. So if you go to the southern hemisphere, it will not flush the other way. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, uh, because the currents are moving like this, uh, clockwise in the northern hemisphere, counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere, floating objects are drawn towards the middle and get stuck there. Another, and on top of that water movement, the atmosphere is also working to accumulate trash in the middle. This is a map showing average wind speeds in the summer in this area. So to orient you, here's Hawaii, here's California, there's Alaska sticking up up there. And the red and orange colors are lots of wind, blue and white, not very much wind. So lots of wind off California, lots of wind, these are the trade winds going by Hawaii, right? But there's this big white spot. And that is the North Pacific High. It's a big atmospheric high that sits there most of the time and makes it the weather really nice, the ocean really calm there, but also makes it so that, again, floating objects get stuck. So you have the water moving in that big North Pacific gyre, and on top of that, you have this atmospheric area where people get stuck, which I will refer to as the big white spot for this talk. And that is why there is trash in this area. Some people have called it the Eastern Garbage Patch. 
So there's been this conception that there is an island of trash. Um, and this has been in pop culture. If you Google uh, garbage patch, you'll come up with some pictures. For example, a guy canoeing through a dense pile of trash. Or there's a um, comic book about a hero who goes and settles. He plants his flag on the island of trash and has adventures walking on it. Makes sense with a giant octopus, too. Um, and so there's this idea that you could go to this island and see it. Um, so that's when we decided to go. Uh, we went out, um, actually, I'll back up a, a little bit. We went out uh, right west from San Diego, um, California, out to the big white spot, and wanted to see what was there. Uh, and took, this was in 2009, although I've been back a couple times since. And what we saw was there was this. I myself took this picture in the middle of the Pacific garbage patch. And you see that the ocean pretty much just looks like normal ocean. But you have to look closer. Oh, and I should say, you do see some floating objects going by. Um, there's our ship in the background, definitely not trash. Um, <laughs> but you see uh, buoys and crates and drink bottles. These are, this is a ghost net, which is about the size of a bus, a big hairball of lost or discarded fishing gear that gets all wadded up and can cause problems to marine life because just because there's a net, a net fishes whether anyone is fishing it or not, so things can get stuck. Um, drink bottles, with those are barnacles growing on them. And, but the vast majority of the trash are these tiny little pieces. So there are these flecks on the surface. Um, for scale, that net there is about this big. So when we look closer, we see that the garbage patch is these tiny pieces. So we're going to have a quick game, very quick, 10 seconds. How many pieces of trash do you see? I'll give you 10 seconds. Go. Two and a half million. <laughs> I hear two and a half million. 15. 15,000. 15, I suspect those are not visual counts. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any other guesses? Yell it out. 35. 35. Okay, in this one, at least I, so I think 35 is the closest, between 15 and 35 will take the average. You see 23 in this area that's only a couple square meters of the ocean surface. We just took it with a camera looking down from the ship. And there's probably even more, because these are only showing the big, larger pieces that we can see, not the smaller ones that we can't see as easily, or the ones that are floating below the ocean's surface. So we try to look at this more scientifically, and we're actually able to go back in time um, using other people's data and also data that was archived at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography where I was studying basically a big library of ocean samples going back 100 years. So we actually had people who had been out to this area in the 70s had taken samples and we could look at them for plastic. And so you see that the big white spot um, still has trash even in the early 70s. And this is amazing because plastic had only been around as a consumer product for 20 years. It only really became widespread in the 1950s. So the fact that there was, at this point, 0.1 little pieces of plastic per cubic meter of surface water in the big white spot is pretty astonishing. In 20 years, this much had gotten there. But if, when we actually updated this with our own data and other people's data, we found that it had increased by 100 times in the last 40 years. So now instead of 0.1 pieces in the big white spot, you see 10 pieces per cubic meter of surface water, which isn't enough to make an island, but it's a lot of plastic over thousands and thousands of square kilometers of the ocean's surface. This plastic has consequences for marine life that lives out there. Now, this marine li this is not a place where you go to catch fish right in the middle there. It's essentially equivalent to a desert in that it's not a lot of growth, but the animals and plants and microbes that live there are very specially adapted to living in an environment where there's not very much food, because there's not very many nutrients. But altogether, the uh, subtropical gyres cover very large areas. So um, the picture of the jar shows what the amount of plastic when you concentrate a swimming pool size amount of ocean into a little jar by filtering it through a net. Looks like a snow globe, just a, thousands of pieces in there. And these pieces are the same size as much of the marine life. This is uh, plastic with a jellyfish called the by the wind sailor, or Valella Valella is the scientific name. It's actually, I think, one of the more wonderful animals that live in the open ocean. It has a little triangular sail, sticks up, and it flows, uh, sticks up into the air, and it sails with the wind across the ocean's surface. They're really cute. Those are about the, the size of, uh, you know, putting your thumb and forefinger together. So the plastic is the same size as the animals, which means that 
the, are interacting with the food web. On the left here is pieces of plastic with three important sources of food in the ocean. This is a baby flying fish, a krill, which is whale food, um, and a Pacific sari, and another important bait fish. And again, the plastic is the same size as them. So when we looked closer, and this is work done by my colleagues, Pete Davison and Rebecca Ash, they found that 9% of the small fish had plastic in their stomachs that they measured. And these are very important fish. These guys are called lanternfish or mctophids, and they're actually the most abundant fish in the ocean. There's one lanternfish for every cubic meter of ocean, and there's sometimes when they come up to the surface at night, if you look with sonar, it looks like the bottom is rising up because there are so many of them. So they are a very important source of food to almost everything else, and so they had a considerable amount of them were eating plastic. Same thing for the barnacles. Um, these are animals, they're like a little shrimp. They live upside down in a shell, kick their feet out to catch food and just shove it in their mouth. And they're not very picky. So since they live actually attached to floating objects, mostly trash on the surface, it's not too surprising that they had 34% of them had plastic in their guts. Most of them just had one or two pieces, but uh, the ruler on top shows that a uh, few of them had 20 or 30. Um, that was the amount number of pieces we pulled out of a single barnacle. Now what this means for the fish and the barnacles, we don't know because we caught them and put them in jars and studied them in the lab. So we don't know what would have happened to them if we hadn't done that. But certainly they are eating plastic and there's the potential for consequences there. Of course, consequences are complicated. Meet the sea skater. Uh, this is a little bug that actually walks on the top of the water. If you ever seen like pond skaters, those, uh, they're very similar, but they live in the open ocean. But because they're descended from pond skaters, their eggs sink. So they have to lay their eggs on floating objects, and now they lay their eggs on plastic. So they're, they're their eggs, they're about the size of a grain of rice. And so for sea skaters, we found more egg, the more plastic there was, the more eggs they laid, and it was great. So um, people ask me if the plastic is, isn't it bad or is it good? I'm like, well, it depends on who you are. I mean, are you an albatross chick that has a belly full of plastic? and uh, that has died um, because of the plastic? Uh, are you a fish that may or may not be having consequences? Or are you a sea skater who's laying your eggs and is just like, hey, this is great. Um, so it's a complicated story. But what I can tell you is that plastic is changing a very old, very large ecosystem. Um, the North Pacific gyre has been in place since the Pliocene, so since mammoths and giant sloths were roaming Europe and North America. It's been like this for a long time, and the animals and plants and microbes that live on floating surfaces on the plastic are not the same as the ones that live naturally in the ocean. And when you put all five subtropical gyres together, they cover 40% of the entire Earth's surface. This is an enormous area of the Earth that we're undergoing a massive change by adding all this plastic, and we don't know what it means. Um, the, because the ocean regulates the climate, and by changing 40% of the entire Earth's surface, we don't know what that will do. People always ask me if it can be cleaned up, um, and I usually sort of try to run away, and then if they corner me, I say, well, it's complicated. Um, <laughs> This is going to sound cliched, but the ocean is very big. You might have noticed this in Norway. I mean, you know, famous seafarers. The ocean is very large. Um, and uh, I put this picture up to show you the size of the net that we use to count the plastic compared to the size of the ocean. It's a net is a meter wide. The North Pacific gyre is three times the size of the United States. You cannot possibly tow a net across that area. Um, and even if you could, as I showed you before, the animals are the same size as the plastic, so you cannot take out the plastic without taking out all the animals. And even in the most plastic polluted places, uh, every, for, we would get an equal weight of marine life for every weight of plastic. So you have to be really sure that you're not going to cause unintended consequences before you take out all the life of the surface of the ocean. But also, there's no wind in the gyres. They're the doldrums of old. So um, you have to burn fossil fuel to get there now. Um, and so you'd be burning these ships, uh, the ship we were on, which is a medium-sized research vessel, burns uh, about $20,000, sorry, I can't convert it under stress, um, $20,000 uh, worth of diesel uh, every day. So it's a massive amount of fuel and it's a massive amount of money, and I, my opinion is the logistical considerations now are pretty severe. So what is the solution? The answer, every solution. 
We actually do know how to make this problem better. We just have to do all those things at once. There are as technology and development that it has created plastic that does biodegrade in the ocean, but right now it is far too expensive to be used as a consumer product. It's used for specialized applications like putting it in nets when you want a screen to biodegrade, but it does exist. Um, in le there's legislation. Many countries and states have banned certain, times, certain kinds of plastic products that they deem problematic. Plastic bags being the widest spread ban or tax, but also drink bottles or uh, styrofoam takeout containers. And there, of course, there's prevention, uh, stopping plastic from getting into the ocean in the first place. Again, it sounds obvious, but actually we're really bad at doing that. Um, every place is downstream from the ocean, so when people throw trash into their local streams and rivers, eventually, even if you don't live on the coast, if it doesn't wash up somewhere, it's going to make its way to the ocean, and we can get a lot better at preventing that from happening. So, admittedly, I titled, I gave this talk a little bit of a provocative title after giving you all this bad news about all the terrible things. So why have I learned to stop worrying and love the garbage patch? The answer is because it is the fact that there is this vast area of the ocean that has this big problem that is directly related to human action motivates people in, on this environmental issue in no way that I've ever seen with any other ocean issue, and I think that's amazing. The, there are people doing cleanups and making art out of trash. There is um, people protesting to advocate for laws that will try to prevent trash. And there's even this, uh, a couple of boats made out of trash that have been sailing around the Pacific. I felt it was especially important to mention this in Oslo because this is the uh, plastiki right here. <laughs> um, so, so, so this issue brings people together to care about an area of the ocean that you can't go to, that most people will never see. There's no islands, there's very few cruise ships. Nobody really spends time in the trackless ocean between Hawaii and California, but somehow people care. And because this ocean is covered in wonderful, wonderful things, despite all the trash which I've just showed you. These are, I mean, I hear that most people like rainbows and dolphins, uh, but I wanted to show you my favorite zooplankton. This is, is, this is my favorite amphipod. I think they're really pretty. But there's, there's rainbows and dolphins out there, too. So <laughs> my hope for the garbage patch is that by being this dramatic issue, that we can directly connect to the paradox of plenty, that we can come together and conserve what we love, that we will love the garbage patch for the many amazing things that it has there besides the trash, and that we can all come together to make this problem better. Thank you.